Assalamu alaikum. My name is Muhammad Ali. I am here to teach an introduction to cultural anthropology. And cultural anthropology is a course being taught within the Department of Sociology at Virtual University. Today I'm going to be spending most of the time trying to familiar, familiarize you people with the basic idea of cultural anthropology, the various issues that are going to be covered in the entire course and essentially what cultural anthropology means. Before I do this, I'll take this opportunity to briefly talk about myself. I am a development professional. I've been working for about 10 years in various capacities in the social sector in Pakistan. And the social sector, by the social sector, I mean working with NGOs. You must have heard of the term NGO. And an NGO is a non-government organization. And non-government organizations work on several types of issues. They work on issues like health, education, irrigation, the livelihoods of various marginalized communities. So in this regard, one gets to travel a lot. I have personally traveled across all parts of the country and seen a lot of the circumstances and a lot of the issues and the problems that face different types of people and different types of communities in our country. And I also do write in newspapers. I'm currently, I'm writing a column on development issues for a newspaper. So this gives me a fairly good sense of the social issues that are relevant within our country and internationally. I have studied international relations and history and more recently I was studying uh, development in Australia. So having said this, now I will try and go on and introduce you to the course objectives, to the specific course objectives. This course will introduce students like yourselves to the very basic and fundamental and important issues concerning the human condition. By virtue of studying cultural anthropology, you will be able to compare and contrast various differences and various similarities between different types of people, between different types of communities, between their customs, between their cultures. And in subsequent sessions of this course, we will try and A, look at the theory, the underlying theory and the methodology by virtue of which you can do that, and also look at the circumstances, the actual circumstances themselves. Some of the major issues that we will cover in, in this course is looking at, for example, at the idea of nationalism. What is nationalism? Looking at the idea of ideology, looking at the idea of political control, social control, looking at the idea of race, looking at the idea of ethnicity. We will look at other important phenomena which are important not only for people in our own country but for people across the globe. And we will also look at issues that have been relevant not only in the present but in the past and how that relevance, how that importance has changed over time.
So basically now I will introduce the idea of anthropology and in, in doing so I will begin by asking a very simple question and that question is what is anthropology and what is it that anthropologists do? Matlab ke anthropology hai kya aur anthro, ek jo anthropologist agar hum kisi ko anthropologist bulaayin to anthropologist karta kya hai? Simply, agar aap iski loves ki meaning ko dekhe, to anthropology jo hai ye Greek zuban se loves nikla hai. Ye do words par mushtamil hai. Ek hai anthropos, jo Greek me anthropos kehte the human ko. And dusra loves hai logos. Logos jo hai wo kehte hai study ko. So, in dono lovesong ko jab milate hain to anthropos and logos se loves ban gaya anthropology. So, anthropology ka matlab hai to study human beings. Now, anthropology and anthropologists in answering the question, what do anthropologists do? What does anthropology do? In trying to answer that question, hum basically ye keh sakte hain most primarily most fundamentally, most basically, anthropologists or anthropology jo hain, wo jo insaniyat ki condition hai, jo human condition hai, usko study kar rahe hain. They are trying to realize and trying to understand essentially what it means to be a human being. What, what are human beings all about? So how do they live? What values they have? What types of cultures they create for themselves and essentially behind all this, behind all this difference, what essentially does it mean to be a human being? Now you can imagine, I mean this is no small undertaking, I mean to try to understand what a human being is, I mean is not, is not an easy venture. I mean this is something that uh, is not only interesting in the sense that we as human beings are trying to understand who we ourselves are, but also the fact that we have to try and understand this issue in its entirety. So we have to look at the idea of humanity, of the human condition as it has evolved over time. We have to also look at the different types of human behavior that exist in the world today. اگر آپ آج اخبار اٹھا کے دیکھیں تو آپ دیکھیں گے کہ دنیا میں دنیا میں کیا آپ اپنے ملک میں دیکھ لیں اپنے صوبے میں دیکھ لیں اپنے شہر میں دیکھ لیں تو ہزاروں لاکھوں قسم کے لائف سٹائلز ہیں لوگ جو ہیں ان کی بلیفز ڈیفرنٹ ہیں the way they dress is different the way they talk is different and these are all people who are supposedly لاہورائٹس who live in لاہور اور پاکستانیز اور مسلمز and yet Within this homogenous group, this similar group, you know, a group with a similar identity, you get all these differences. So trying to understand something like this is not easy. It sounds simple that, oh, a child anthropologist kya kar raha hai? Wo to sirf dekh raha hai ke insaan kya hai? Wo to hum, hum sab ko pata tha. Hum, hum khud hai insaan. But it's, there, there's more to it than meets the eye. Is me, انتھروپالوجی کی سٹڈی میں بیسکلی سب سے پہلی چیز جو آپ کو ذہن میں رکھنی پڑے گی وہ یہ ہے کہ انتھروپالوجی جو ہے وہ ایک ملٹی ڈسپلنری سبجیکٹ ہے ملٹی ڈسپلنری اس طرح کے یہ کئی ایکیڈیمک سبجیکٹس کئی ایکیڈیمک پرنسپلز کے اوپر بیسڈ ہے انتھروپالوجی کیونکہ اس کا سکوپ جو ہے وہ اتنا امبیشس ہے اتنا براڈ ہے اتنا وسیع ہے that it can not be based on a mathematical formula. It can not be based on a particular small branch. It has to have an integrative, a very large approach. It has to rely on different disciplines, different academic disciplines. And اس کے جو anthropology کے جو theorists ہیں, جو writers ہیں, experts ہیں anthropology کے, 
وہ یہ کہتے ہیں کہ انتھروپالوجی جو ہے وہ دراصل ایک برج کا کام کرتی ہے اور وہ برج کا کام کرتی ہے بائی برجنگ دا گیپ بٹوین دا ہیومینٹیز وچ از اے کلسٹر آف سبجیکٹس انتھروپالوجی برجز دا گیپ بٹوین دا سوشل سائنسز بٹوین دا ہیومینٹیز اینڈ بٹوین دا نیچرل سائنسز لیٹ می ٹرائی ٹو ایکسپلین ٹو یو تھرو دا سلائڈ ہاؤ انتھروپالوجی اٹینس ٹو ڈو دس اسٹڈیز آف فوک لو آرٹ ویلیوز اینڈ بلیفس آر ہیومنسٹک ان نیچر ناؤ اسینشلی انتھروپالوجی وین اٹ لکس ایٹ ہیومن ایٹ ٹریٹس آف ہیومن بہیویئر آف پرٹیکولر ٹائپس آف بہیویئرز دیٹ ہیومن بینگز انگیج ان فار ایگزامپل دا ویلیوز دے ہیو فار ایگزامپل دا آرٹ دے کریٹ فار ایگزامپل دا فوک لور دیٹ دے دیٹ سوسائٹی اسپن اراؤنڈ دم سیلس دیز آر آل سبجیکٹس دیٹ کنسرن دا ہیومینٹیز سو ان دس سینس انتھروپالوجی از اے سبجیکٹ دیٹ لکس ایٹ دا ہیومینٹیز دا سیکنڈ ایریا دیٹ انتھروپالوجی لکس ایٹ از اسٹڈیز سوشل اسٹریٹیفیکیشن اٹ لکس ایٹ کمپیریٹو پولیٹیکل سسٹمس اینڈ مینس آف ڈسٹریبیوشن which involves social sciences like political science, economics, and sociology. Now, within anthropology, there is, there is this trend to look at the social structures that are created within the field. So, anthropologists will be concerned with issues of economics, with issues of political science, and these are looking at the larger processes that govern human behavior. So in this sense, anthropology provides a gap, a bridging gap between the humanities and between the social sciences. It also studies or compares human anatomies, for example. And in doing so, it uses things like carbon dating, which involves natural sciences like chemistry, like biology. Now, carbon dating is biological a scientific a technique which looks at the erosion of carbon within living beings and by looking at the amount of carbon which has eroded from living beings it can determine their age now as you can imagine this is a fairly technical kind of uh, kind of a venture and anthropologists when they have to look at human human behavior and human ways of being in the past they often rely on things like carbon dating and they not only look at human beings from the past they look at the evolutionary cycle of human beings and for that purpose they look at the the tools for example that were used by human beings they look at the seeds that human beings used to grow they look at the their evolution from from other primates and you know the evolution of human beings so these are these are all subjects which involve hardcore as it were sciences i mean they involve use of biology use of chemistry and hence one can say that anthropology links provides a natural link and integrates various disciplines together and these are disciplines like the natural sciences the social sciences and the humanities now i'll talk a bit further about the idea of the various disciplines within anthropology since today is our first lecture to the idea of of anthropology i want to give a flavor a general flavor to introduce not only cultural anthropology but some of the other major branches in anthropology physical anthropology is the study of humans from a biological perspective now physical anthropology is an important very important branch of anthropology physical anthropologists basically look at two things they look at like i was saying earlier they try to look at the evolution of human beings of the human species how over thousands and thousands and 
possibly millions of years ago how human beings slowly evolved from other primates to take the form of the current Homo sapien that, that stands here before you. Now this is a scientific theory called the evolutionary theory and scientists who look at basically bones by carbon dating them, by analyzing them are called paleontologists. So paleontologists, physical anthropologists who look at the evolution of human beings, of how human beings have evolved over time from a scientific viewpoint. And in this regard, one has to realize that anthropologists are basically concerned with the environmental and the cultural factors that led to the evolution of human beings. And this differentiates them from, from biologists, from evolutionary biologists. Since they, are, since they are anthropologists, they will be looking at the environment within which human beings evolved, how that environment influenced the way that they evolved. Then another branch, I mean you can see the, get a, I hope you are getting a sense of the vastness of the subject of anthropology. And to, to add to that, let me, I'm still talking about the idea of, uh, of anthropology from a biological perspective. There is, within this branch, this one branch, there is also a field of specialization in which anthropologists don't look at human evolution over time. They look at human beings as they exist right here and right now. And they try to see that within human beings, within the human species, why is it that there are biological differences? For example, the Chinese adult has difficulty digesting milk. This is a scientific fact. The Aborigines community in Australia does not, you will not find any Aboriginal indigenous Australian who has the blood type O. This is a scientific fact. So these are the issues that exist in, in, in the world of today, in, in human beings today. I mean, these are differences between the Chinese, between the Aborigines, uh, and between other types of people. These are biological differences that are currently found in the world today. And anthropologists are concerned by these issues. I mean, they wonder and they try to investigate what environmental factors, what cultural evolutionary factors make certain people different biologically. I mean, one glaring example that we are all familiar with is the color of skin. I mean, why is it that certain people have darker skin and other people have lighter skin and different types of hair and different types of eye color? Now, these are issues that these anthropologists will look at. The second branch of anthropology is archaeology. Archaeology studies lives of people from the past by examining the material culture that they have left behind. You will notice here that material, one refers to the study, in the study of archaeology, one refers to the word material culture. What is material culture? Material culture are things that human beings have left behind, physical things. For example, the types of clothes they wore, the types of tools they used, the jewelry that the women wore, the weapons that the men had, the types of seeds that were planted, their physical infrastructure of their cities, of their towns, their uh, places of worship. And these things are found by archaeologists when they excavate sites. I mean, in Pakistan, we have tremendous archaeological treasures. I mean, we have Harappa, we have Mohenjo-daro, we have uh, Texela in uh, Texela district in Rawalpindi. And uh, 
uh, sorry, in Taxila Tehsil in Rawalpindi district. And Taxila is an amazing example of the Gandhara civilization, which archaeologists from around the world have studied. And they have found within Taxila an intermingling of uh, Hellenistic and Buddhist cultures. Hellenistic cultures are those that came from Greece uh, by virtue of Alexander the Great. And Buddhism, as you know, was very much prevalent in the region, spread by uh, one of the Hindu kings in the area about 3,000 years ago, whose name was Ashoka. So these are material objects that archaeologists look at and they try to see how human beings have uh, used to live. And from these material objects, I mean, sometimes they're lucky enough to find writings. Often, writings are not readily found if uh, archaeologists ex excavate certain uh, sites. But in cases where writings are there, like in Egypt, I mean, that, that makes it easier for them. And by virtue of these physical things, the archaeologists are also able to make assessments regarding non-material aspects of, of human behavior. They can get a fairly good idea of the level of understanding of the types of beliefs that uh, certain different types of people used to hold by virtue of looking at their material culture. So this is again a rich and fairly complex branch of anthropology. The next branch is that of anthropological linguistics, which studies human speech and human language. Now, anthropological linguistics is also divided into various sub-branches. I mean, they are anthropological linguists who will look at the historical aspect of, of language. They will look at how language has evolved over time. I mean, language is essentially a very significant part of our humanity since it allows us to communicate symbolically with other people and not many other species can even do that even at, at a very basic level. And language, of course, is fairly complex. So historical linguists will look at the idea of language evolving alongside the evolution of human beings. Then they are linguists who look at, actually study the rules and the principles and the structures and the grammatical and linguistic principles by which language can be commonly understood by all those who speak that language. And it tries to see how different language systems vary. Then there are linguists with, uh, within the field of anthropology who will look at language and its interaction with social environments, how language is used in particular settings, in particular situations. I mean, we, uh, for example, have in Pakistan, we have several forms of address when we are communicating with people, depending on who that person is. I mean. And that level of communication can range from, uh, in terms of verb usage, can range from use of aap, tum, tu, which is completely informal. And uh, the French similarly have a distinction when, when they're trying to talk formally, they use the verb vu, and when they're trying to talk informally, they use the verb tu. So similarly, there are other cultures that have various ways of talking and use language in a situational manner. And these linguists are concerned and try to see how language is used in that manner. Then finally is cultural anthropology, which studies cultural differences and similarities around the world. So uh, having briefly described the branches of anthropology to you, now I will move on to cultural anthropology which is the basic focus of this course. Cultural anthropology is the study of contemporary cultures and 
the underlying patterns of human culture derived from cultural comparisons. So they will, anthropologists will undertake ethnographies. They will go into communities, go into the field as it is. I mean, that's the technical term for anthropologists going to study a particular culture or a particular way of being is uh, referred to as going into the field. It doesn't necessarily mean kheti badi. I mean, it is basically, it can be within going to a particular location which is urban. I mean, it can be anthropologists study the culture of drug addicts in New York. So, I mean, it can, it, it, that can still be referred to as going into the field. So, anthropologists will undertake these ethnographies in which they will take detailed field notes and there are various other methods that we will later talk about of how they observe particular behaviors of particular communities. And having done this, they then look at the similarities and the differences between these various cultures around the world. Areas of specialization in cultural anthropology. Urban anthropology studies the impact of urbanization on rural societies and the dynamics of life within cities. So urban anthropologists basically are concerned with the phenomena of urbanization, which is a recent phenomena in the sense that it's been ongoing since a few centuries and particularly accelerated over the last hundred years or so. And then within these last hundred years, within the last 30 years, this phenomena of urbanization has spread from the industrialized world into the developing countries. Now you have urban communities, fast growing urban communities in places like Bombay, in places like New Mexico, in places like near Rio de Janeiro in uh, South America. And Karachi itself is, is, a, is a mega city. And anthropologists look at this phenomena of urbanization and they look at how rural communities, when they shift to urban centers, how it changes them. How someone who has been working in the fields his whole life, when he moves into the city with his family, how it changes and affects his, his life. They also look at particular aspects of uh, living in the city. And in this regard, in, in Pakistan, for example, I mean, we have this phenomenon of kachi abadis, where, you know, people live in makeshift arrangements at close quarters to their places of work. And uh, this is a phenomenon that has its own culture. And there are anthropologists from developing countries which have in their scope of research which have this as a priority to look at uh, the lives of uh, people who, li who live in Kachi Abadis. The next branch of specialization within anthropology is that of medical anthropology. Medical anthropologists study biological and socio-cultural factors that affect health or prevalence of illness or disease in human societies. Medical anthropologists will look at particular biological, particular manifestations, implications of biological problems or issues. And to give you an example of this, take the issue of, of um, uh, female, uh, of female mortality, the death of females, or the issue of uh, young girls dying at an early age, of infant mortality, and the gender bias within that, of young females uh, tending to die more frequently than boys. I mean, this is an issue that has implications uh, in terms of uh, nutritional intake. I mean, Hamare Mulk mein, Hamare Jaise or Gharib Mulko mein, ye aksar hota hai ke Walden, Gurbat ki vaja se, unke paas apne bachon ko khane ke liye, khana khilane ke liye, uh, paise nahi hote. 
اور جب ان کے چھ سات بچے ہوں تو یہ ٹینڈنسی ہوتی ہے کہ جو لڑکے ہیں ان کو جو خوراک ہے وہ پھر بھی کہیں نہ کہیں سے تھوڑی بہت جو خوراک ہے وہ ان کو شاید زیادہ مل جاتی ہے اینڈ ایز اے ریزلٹ فیمیلس ڈینائڈ انفارچونیٹلی ڈینائڈ ویلیوبل وائٹل نیسیسری نیوٹریشن وچ کین سم ٹائمز ایون لیڈ ٹو ڈیتھ سو دیز آر ایشوز دیٹ میڈیکل اینتھروپالوجسٹ ول ویری مچ بی کنسرنڈ ود دا نیکسٹ برانچ آف اینتھروپالوجی کنسرنس ایجوکیشن اینڈ ایجوکیشن اینتھروپالوجسٹ اسٹڈی پروسیسیز آف لرننگ آف بوتھ فارمل ایجوکیشن انسٹیٹیوٹس اینڈ ان فارمل سسٹمس وچ کین یوز اسٹوری ٹیلنگ اور ایکسپیرینشل لرننگ فار ایگزامپل ناؤ ایجوکیشن از اے وائٹل اینڈ ویری امپورٹنٹ ایسپیکٹ آف لائف آف کلچر اینڈ اینتھروپالوجس لک ایٹ ایجوکیشن ان two broad categories they look at the formal schooling system and they also look at the informal schooling system i mean there are countries ours included where which has a literacy rate of about 40% i mean where there are thousands of villages across the country that don't have primary schools where there are alternative means of imparting knowledge of sharing knowledge with with the uh, of offspring i mean children if they don't go to school doesn't necessarily mean don't pick up any life skills it doesn't mean that they are completely devoid of knowledge agar ek bachcha school nahi jata to halanki wo literate nahi hoga uske paas functional literacy nahi hogi wo daftar mein kaam nahi kar sakta as a office worker magar iska ye matlab to nahi hai ki wo insaan hi nahi hai wo usko kisi cheez ki samajh hi nahi hai so ye کئی جو ان فارمل سسٹمز ہیں آف امپارٹنگ نالج اینڈ اس میں کئی بڑی ٹیکنیکل اسکلز بھی سکھائی جاتی ہیں جو شاگردی کا سسٹم ہے ہمارے ملک میں وہ اس میں آرٹیزنس بڑے بڑے فنکار جو ہیں وہ شاگردی کے سسٹم سے نالج انہوں نے حاصل کیا ہے اینڈ ان کا دنیا میں ہمارے ملک میں نہیں تو باہر کی دنیا میں ان کا ایک ایک رتبہ ہے and isi tarah aur they are indigenous communities around the world which have impart functional life coping skills in tanzania for example they are hunting tribes which interact with peers which interact with elders to uh, learn and acquire hunting skills which are necessary to to live to eat so these are informal educational systems in a formal educational system anthropologists will essentially go and look at the administrative structure look at the the teachers look at the teachers interaction with the students look at the educational policies which affect the state of education the state of literacy and hence educational anthropology is a very important branch of cultural anthropology the next branch of anthropology that is important and which we will talk about in the future is that of economic anthropology and economic anthropology studies how goods and services are produced distributed and consumed within different cultural contexts so economic anthropologists look at the means by which lab- the division of labor takes place how particular types of people get to get assigned to do particular types of jobs i mean one obvious example in this regard uh, from past history is that of the caste system in india which used to assign particular functions that of a warrior that of a worshipper that of someone who was considered to be an untouchable to to uh, birthright so people born into a particular household had to perform a particular type of a task a particular type of a duty and this is an issue which we will take up uh, in subsequent lectures but economic anthropology looks at these types of issues it also looks at more uh, current issues i mean you can for example you can uh, consider the case of globalization which is a very important and uh, much talked about 
topic in in the media, in on television, and uh, essentially an economic anthropologist can look at the idea of globalization or a policy within globalization, let's say liberalization, the policy of liberalization and the effect of liberalization on the economic policies of a particular developing country, let's say Pakistan. So an economic anthropologist could study the effect of economic liberalization on the condition of rural women, of the, on the condition of rural local livelihoods, how a local producer who uh, uh, undertakes embroidery, for example, how her life is affected by import of cheap uh, machine-made clothes from China. So that is a subject for an, for an economic anthropologist to consider. The other main branch of anthropology is that of psychological anthropology. Psychological anthropology studies relationships between cultures and the psychological makeup of individuals belonging to them. Now, psychological anthropology was basically, it came into fashion in the United States at uh, the time of the Second World War. And uh, the American uh, anthropologists took, uh, undertook these national character studies. They tried to study the psyche of the Japanese, of the Russians, in, in an attempt to get to know the enemy, as it were. And essentially, this branch uh, is still in existence. I mean, it looks at the implications of culture on the psyche of individuals, how particular cultures mold the psychological ways of thinking, patterns of behavior of individuals who belong to those cultures. So this is again a very interesting and a very important field of study within cultural anthropology. Now, cultural anthropology, as you can now imagine, I mean, we have, in this introductory uh, first lecture, we have covered a lot of ground. I mean, we've uh, tried to uh, give various examples of how cultural anthropology is important and how it is a part of everyday life. Now, in an attempt to study human behavior, one has to, by definition, take a holistic approach, an approach that looks at issues over time, over location, over space, an approach that can transcend these limitations. So cultural anthropologists consider influences of nature and nurture across all locations and across different periods of time. By this, what I'm trying to, uh, to tell you here is that anthro cultural anthropologists will undertake various uh, considerations into mind. They will look at uh, the idea of nature, of how biology, of how environmental circumstances influence human behavior. They will also look at how nurture, of how our parents, of how the social institutions like educational institutions, political institutions, uh, governments, how they influence human behavior. So they look at both nature and nurture. Then cultural anthropology is not bound by time. It does not look at human behavior after 1947. It does not look at human behavior only uh, in the 10th century. It looks at human behavior from the beginning of human beings. I mean, from as far possible as, you, as, as is possible to go. I mean, there's a paleontologist who discovers, you know, bones from prehistoric times. Uh, he will go and investigate that, those, those, uh, that evidence and, and try to figure out how that evidence features into the evolution of, of human beings. So there's no time barrier 
as such. There is no locational barrier on cultural anthropology. I mean, till about 40, 50 years ago, the fashion was for Western anthropologists to go and look at exotic cultures, to go and study the Aborigines, to go and study people in Papua New Guinea, to go and look at uh, African tribes, to come to the subcontinent and look at the lifestyle of a sadhu. But now they are anthropologists who are trained from all these countries, from all these parts of the world, who can look at their own people and who can also look at the West. And they are also Western anthropologists who look at subcultures, subgroups within their own society. So in that sense, there is, there is this over, overarching, integrative, uh, holistic approach that, that is taken for a subject like cultural anthropology which is a very ambitious and, and, and a very useful and a very relevant and important subject. Now, when various specialities of the discipline are viewed together, they provide a comprehensive view of the human condition. Like I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of specializations within, within cultural anthropology. I mean, there are urban anthropologists, there are uh, anthropologists who will look at the biological aspects of human beings, and all these anthropologists essentially have, not only do they relate to uh, disciplines outside anthropology, they also take into view and try to integrate the findings of other anthropologists. So a biological anthropologist will also be, be talking to a cultural anthropologist and try to see how particular bone structures, for example, were conditioned by cultural requirements. Let's say, I mean, for, for people who, uh, uh, the Afro-Americans who were subjugated by, due to political and social circumstances to work as slaves on plantations in America, uh, tended to develop very muscular uh, sort of physiques. And this was, now this has both a cultural and a biological implication. And here is, you know, here is a phenomena that deserves a cross, an overlapping in a, in a cross-disciplinary approach. So, I mean, an, anthropolog an anthropologist who specializes in biological issues and an anthropologist who specializes in cultural issues will sit down together on a table or work on the same paper to try and explain one particular formula, phenomena. So this is an integrative approach within cultural anthropology. And this is necessary in the attempt to understand the complexities of human behavior. Now, there are two fairly generic standard responses to cultural difference. Though, आम तौर पर जो सबसे common natural reactions हैं to difference जो आपको कोई चीज मुख्तलफ लगे तो उसमें आपके automatically दो reactions हो सकते हैं और जो पहला reaction है जिसके बारे में मैं वजहत थोड़ी सी मैं करूँगा वो कुछ ज़्यादा ही unfortunately common और वो है ethnocentrism ethnocentrism is a belief that one's own culture is not only the most desirable but also superior to that of others. Now, ethnocentrism is something for which there is uh, plenty of evidence around the world. And it's quite natural also, you know, to try to understand the world from our own particular upbringing, background, culture, and to try and think of other people from from our own viewpoints. But ethnocentrism can also be problematic if we uh, assume a sense of superiority and we think that our culture is the best culture and people who are like us also all right, but people who are different from us are not all right. And, and uh, the colonial empire and, and the British in particular did do this. I mean, they had a sense of superiority and they thought that only people who can behave in a certain manner which was as English as possible were, you know, functional human beings and people who were very different from them in terms of dress, 
language and customs were savages and they went out to uh, to sort of civilize the savages as it were in in Africa in most of Africa in the subcontinent i mean they were somewhat impressed by by the grandeur of the Mughal empire but in Africa i mean they had a very ethnocentric overtly ethnocentric attitude the other type of reaction to cultural difference is that of cultural relativism which looks at the inherent logic behind different cultures and practices in the attempt to understand them now cultural relativism is trying to look at the look at the basic logic of why people behave in a particular way for example the eskimo in uh, the in the arctic circle who are called the inuit uh, they have there certain groups within the inuit who had and still probably have this custom of leaving very old people who cannot uh, contribute to to the uh, sort of the well-being of the group they leave them out in the cold to die now this seems like an almost inhuman behavior but from a cultural relativist position one can try and understand that this is not sprung as a surprise on on the parents i mean this is something that they know their whole lives that when they grow old and can't work they will be left out in the cold to die this is also done because life is so tough in the arctic circle i mean that anyone who cannot make a positive contribution to the maintenance of the group is has to be cut out because the group cannot look after that person be it even their own parents if they can't if they're not tough enough to survive they will threaten the the very survival of the whole group so this is a cultural relativist position but there's a danger here i mean a if you there's an ethical danger if you look at every every circumstance you can find compulsions for it you can look at what hitler did in nazi germany and killed 6 million jews i mean there were reasons for that there were political reasons for that there were strategic reasons for that but there is a there is a bottom line beyond which one has to try and make value judgments and also methodologically there's there's a problem here i mean if can you imagine as a cultural anthropologist if you go and try and only understand various cultures and the reasons why people behave in a particular way there would be no basis of comparison i mean you could not have you know any basis for drawing similarities differences you could not understand the bottom line of what it means to be a human being so there has to be a balance somewhere within the idea of cultural relativism now i will try to wrap up here the first lecture by again emphasizing the importance the relevance of cultural anthropology cultural anthropology enhances understanding of differences and prevents oversimplified generalizations so cultural anthropologists since they see the the deeper meaning of difference they do not make generalizations they will not say that only intelligent people are those who can speak english i mean that would be a generalization a sweeping generalization it will not say that only people who earn above 1 lakh rupees are, uh, have intelligence i mean they will try to see differences by studying cultural anthropology you can get self knowledge about how you think about your own values about your own behavior and this is also necessary i mean when one looks at various cultures and various ways of being you can reflect upon your own circumstances and the and what you think for yourself and you can be a more informed person and and be able to see where you are coming from in a much more interesting and insightful manner cultural anthropology develops cognitive complexity through integration and differentiation integration and differentiation basically means that it allows people to look at the 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 holistic the entire picture it it allows them to look at all the circumstances which lead to a particular behavior it looks at socio cultural 
political processes by which poverty of of a particular person exists and also it can look at the poverty of a particular person as a symptom of larger political economic socio cultural circumstances so it allows you to look at the sums and to look at the bigger picture and the difference between the two cultural anthropology finally which brings me to the conclusion of the lecture facilitates meaningful interaction with other cultures and subcultures so in our current world given the amount of difference that exists in our world it is very necessary for us to be able to try and understand other cultures to try and understand the subcultures which exist within our own societies and uh, with the phenomena of globalization this is a skill a very useful skill that make can make us much more functional much more productive citizens of the world so i would again urge you to pay attention to this course and i hope that i have been able to convince you of the relevance of cultural anthropology and with this i will wrap up the first session for today and i hope that i have given you enough substance to think about and uh, i hope that you were able to understand and enjoy this first lecture and i thank you for your time and khuda hafiz